Welcome to Hub Dialogues. I'm your host, Sean Spear, editor-at-large at The Hub. I'm honored to be back in conversation with David Frum for another installment of our bi-weekly video and podcast series on the key issues concerning Canadian policy and politics. In today's conversation, we'll discuss two seemingly contradictory developments when it comes to North America's production of oil and gas. The first is a new private member's bill in Canada from an NDP member of parliament that would impose a federal ban on most advertising or promotion about the country's oil and gas sector. The second is North America's growing share of global oil production, which now exceeds 20% and may soon reach one quarter. These two stories ought to cause us to think responsibly about North America as an energy superpower. What are the economic opportunities? How do we manage the environmental challenges? Presumably the answer isn't advertising bans, but I'm looking forward to getting David's perspective. David, thanks as always for joining us. Thank you so much. I suppose we should start with Bill C-372, the Fossil Fuels Advertising Act, which, as I said, stipulates that it is, quote, prohibited for a person to promote a fossil fuel, a fossil fuel related brand element or the production of a fossil fuel, unquote, with few exceptions and threatens penalties, including fines and imprisonment for those who do. Although the bill, which was tabled by NDP MP Charlie Angus, is unlikely to pass, it has provoked a strong reaction, David, on both the left and the right, and arguably signals, signals something about the state of political debate concerning Canada's oil and gas sector. What's your reaction to the draft legislation? Is it just a legislative rant by an unrepresentative member of parliament, or does it actually tell us something bigger? Well, it tells us something. It tells us this, which is that there are a lot of people who want to see energy as an issue of personal morality, virtue, and vice. Um, that the reason that we use fossil fuels is because of wicked fossil fuel companies uh, who impose these dreadful things on us that none of us would want if we weren't um, compelled uh, by big big industry uh, to drive cars, um, and that the answer therefore is to fight the industry. And it, it's a it's it's a childish way to think, right? That that is not why we're in the situation we're in. That um, we have we use fossil fuels because they're massively productive. Um, if supposing the bill passed, supposing we are absolutely prove no one could ever no one could ever tell you um, <laughs> uh, when you're thinking about refilling the car, uh, go to this service station rather than that one. So today you would do exactly what you do today, which is you'd go to the closest one because you're going to refill the car. But um, it wants to present the individual as the victim of rapacious oil companies rather than um, confronting what we actually have, which is a combined economic and environmental challenge. Uh, but, you know, we were talking just before we began that this habit of moralizing energy is is quite prevalent. It's not just on the left that wants to ban it. It's on, on uh, we saw this in the Trump era where Trump subsidized coal because coal was good. Uh, and even if coal didn't make economic sense, we should still use it. Uh, because coal represents what um, you know, some some vision of of life, and there are people who um, want to say that, that not only do we need to responsibly use fossil fuels now, but we need never to plan for any way to get past them, uh, nor need nor are we going to make any concessions. The fact that the market is telling us that that, that the day of the fossil fuel is passing, we can see we have passed peak coal. In North America, we passed it. Now that's now almost twenty years ago. We passed the, at the end of the uh, double zeros. We are likely to be on our way to passing peak um, oil for North America, and not because we're running out of the stuff, but because we're going to be using less of it. And the day may soon come for natural gas. We need to think about all of these um, as economic decisions and not as lifestyle decisions or as moral decisions. The the challenge here is the is our need to use it, not because somebody bad is doing something to or for us. Yeah, a, a, a ton of insight uh, there, there, David. And I want to take up um, the subject of of trade-offs because I think it is at the heart of, of a lot of these conversations, or at least ought to be. Um, even if one thinks that Angus's bill is dumb, which it manifestly, manifestly is, there are efforts afoot in Canada, including a possible emissions cap on the oil and gas sector that that would impose more stringent environmental treatment. Um, the argument, of course, is that the oil and gas sector in Canada is the, our largest source of GHG emissions, but it's also a major source of economic activity and employment in the country as a whole, and in certain provinces like Alberta and Saskatchewan in particular. How should we think about these trade-offs in your mind, David? Well, it's not the sector. When you say um, this sector produces, it would be as if we said um, uh, the, uh, the farming sector is the major produ producer of obesity. Well, 
<laughs> I ultimately, yes, <laughs> but there are a few steps along the way. The food is consumed. We all eat it. Um, and it's not, and it's, and the farmers are not out there uh, compelling us or brainwashing us into eating food that we otherwise wouldn't eat. We eat because we like to eat. They make it possible for us to eat. Um, and uh, definitely it would be true that if you um, put taxes on certain foods, uh, you might change consumer behavior, but that wouldn't make the producers of those foods villains. They're just meeting a need. Um, so we have, uh, we, we need, to, I, I think the thing we need to keep coming back to is we need to first, climate change is happening and it's dangerous. It's driven by human activity. That human activity is not uh, is governed by national governments, but most national government governments don't have the clout to do anything on their own. So, if you want to think about how do you affect man-made climate change, you have to think about governments partnering with like-minded governments. Um, and so, for Canada to do to do anything by itself is is symbolic and not very effective. To can for Canada to do things with the United States or ideally with the United States and Mexico, um, and then work with other democratic trading blocks, that's that's how you get to a solution. But I can't imagine that anybody responsible thinks that it's a good thing if in 25 years we are using oil and gas on the scale that we're using them now. I mean, surely we all agree we want to be on the downward slope, uh, but how we get there at what speed and with what partnerships, that's, that's where politics comes in. Uh, we'll come to... Um climate policy and, and even geopolitics in a minute. But I want to take up your, your last point. Um, uh, because there are transition costs that it seems to me policymakers need to concern themselves with. Uh, I mentioned that Canada's oil and gas sector is a pretty big employer. It's something like three or 4% nationally, and as much as one in 10 uh, workers in Alberta. But there's also a qualitative dynamic uh, at play here too, David. There's considerable research, including some that I've contributed to, that shows that labor demand in the oil and gas sector has helped Canada to minimize the rise of so-called job polarization, in which the share of mid-skilled jobs has significantly fallen in other peer jurisdictions. Uh, there's a good case, in fact, that Canada's natural resources have sustained the country's middle class. Mm -hmm. take, take up that point, David. How much should the distributional effects, the who and the where, loom over policymakers as they tackle these issues? Um, it's probably true, and it was true in the United States, too, that... Um, oil and gas production generate a lot of jobs for um, people who don't have a lot of education at relatively high wages. They favor men over women. I mean, that's that. I mean, why, why do, why do, has the Republican party taken it so much to heart that, that if you're a party that speaks for non-college educated men, um, then obviously you like jobs that are, uh, are uh, attractive to non-college educated men. Um, but at, at, it's, it's a real point, but it's, you cannot run um, fundamental issues of life and death because they affect certain kinds of industries. I mean, th then you get to, you know, you, you that, that's how you get to all the, the the silliest things that Canada does. Why why do we why do Canadians pay so much for milk and cheese? Well, because the farmer, the family farm, represents a, a way of life that must be preserved at any cost. At any cost, at the cost of like paying everybody in the country paying double and triple the world price for cheese and milk. Um, you know, it's, at some level, we say, you know, you may have to earn your living in a, in a different kind of way. Um, so, yes, we want to be conscious of um, well, there are a lot of things that are easy for some people to say, but not, it is never guaranteed that the shape of the economy is going to continue unchanged. And when you have something that is as potentially dangerous for the future as um, greenhouse gases, you can't sacrifice the whole planet in order to protect certain categories of jobs. Um, moving beyond merely economic considerations, let's talk about some of the other consequences of North America's growing share of global oil production. The U.S. became a net exporter of oil in 2020 and is quickly becoming bigger than Saudi Arabia in terms of crude oil production. That believe must have. I believe Sorry? it all. I believe the United States already is bigger than Saudi Arabia. So that that to, to that point, that must have big consequences. Does it, for instance, possibly diminish over the medium or long term the geopolitical importance of the Middle East? Does it influence U.S. foreign policy in other areas? Talk about what that means for North America and the world. Well, I, I am confident that 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 shift has already begun. Uh, one of the reasons why the Gulf powers um, have become much more responsible actors in the past 15 years, one of the reasons they're doing things like signing peace treaties with Israel is because they see that their future is not as energy producers, but as bankers, um, that the United Arab Emirates is going to be sitting on top 
25 years from now of a giant pool of cash, um, but it's going to need access to world financial markets. It's going to need expertise. They can't be pariahs. Um, and the Saudis are on, they have a bigger population and they have less political stability than the United Arab Emirates. So more difficulties there, but you you see that. And um, it also raises, raises all kinds of questions like um, how important is it the United States to protect the stability of these countries that, um, that we we have talked before about this strange shape of Middle East peacemaking, where uh, Israel wants diplomatic recognition from Saudi Arabia. Saudi Arabia's price is it wants a, a military guarantee from the United States. And the holdup mm. on uh, this peacemaking has been that the United States just doesn't think that it, Saudi Arabia is as strategically vital as it used to be. And given the um, things like the murder of, of the journalist Khashoggi, um, and other instances where of Saudi Arabia miscalculation, the United States is not so sure it wants to write that security check to Saudi Arabia. Why not? Because we all wonder in 25 years, will Saudi Arabia be so important to the United States as opposed to say India or China? Um, it also means that there are opportunities for North America to lever um, its power. And we've talked before about the importance of um, Canada um, working with the United States to have an integrated natu liquid natural gas export program so that you can shift European dependence away from Russia toward North American LNG. LNG is uh, is more expensive, but it's more reliable. Um, and uh, it, it has to be part of the European mix. But that means, where does Asia get its natural gas from? Canada is better positioned to ship to Asia than the United States is. Um, and you need pipelines that allow um, South Korea and Japan and even China to be supplied by Canadian natural gas, while American natural gas, gas flows more from the Gulf ports toward Europe. Um, but you cannot allow this to be driven by the most immediate short-term considerations. It is such a big problem. And I, the goal is we, we do not want in the second half of the century to be using fossil fuels in the way that we have been doing until this point. It just is too dangerous. Yeah, to, to that point, David, as you say, a, a key goal ought to be to ensure that North America's status as an energy superpower doesn't remain limited to fossil fuels. Uh, what should we be doing to cultivate an advantage in new and cleaner forms of energy? And to take up something you said earlier, to what extent should it be pursued as, as separate domestic policy agendas or seen as ultimately a continental one? Um, well, I, uh, I'm i an advocate of, of thinking about it continentally because I believe that there has to be an explicit or implicit price to um, greenhouse gases. And if, if carbon taxes are out of style in Canada and the United States, then you do it some other way. But you need a price to know what makes sense to do and what doesn't make sense to do. And that price is much more effectively set if it is part of a North American trading block than just a Canadian only price. Um, that's that's the goal. What um, what can we do? We can uh, we can think about integrating nuclear power into into grids. We can think about um, there's a lot of Canadian investment in building solar facilities in northern Mexico. Um, that, that could then feed uh, the southwestern United States. Um, but we want all of this to be led by market forces which um, and not by government action. And we want it to be driven by what is the surest, safest, most economical form of energy with the fewest uh, environmental trade-offs. And while jobs are a nice plus, uh, it's not a job strategy. Um, and jobs are a byproduct. When, when you, if you start thinking, how do we maintain jobs as priority one, Pretty soon you're going to be suppressing innovation of all kinds and not just in the energy sector, because all innovation disrupts jobs as we've known them in the past. I've been in Ottawa a couple of times over the past few weeks, David, and I've been struck by how much the Biden administration's Inflation Reduction Act looms over policy discussions about energy and the environment. A big question, however, of course, is whether the IRA and the ideas behind it are durable. Well, let me put it to you directly. To what extent is the IRA at this point the subject of some bipartisan agreement? Or is it at risk of being scuppered in the event that we have a presidential transition after the November elections? I don't think there's a bipartisan consensus, but I don't think it's going to be scuppered. Because even if there is an election result that returns Donald Trump to the presidency, he's not going to be passing legislation. It's going to be chaos all the time. And he is about, uh, he's going to be about legal self-preservation, shutting down the judge. There are going to be no laws passed in the first two years of a Trump administration and on its way to one, as it careens from one constitutional crisis to another. So just as uh, Trump failed to overturn um, the Affordable Care Act, I don't think it's even less likely that he'll make any progress against the Inflation Reduction Act. But here's the thing I would say to uh, people in Ottawa about it. 
Canadians are very frightened by the uh, Inflation Reduction Act because it's very protectionist. Why? Why is it so threatening to Canada? Well, because the Americans made a decision, instead of taxing the energy they don't want, to subsidize the energy they do. But guess what? Subsidies come from national governments and are riddled with favoritism. Um, that understand, uh, I, I know, again, it's out of style, the greenhouse gas, the greenhouse taxes are out of style, um, but just understand that they are the most market-friendly, trade-friendly um, policy. And when your neighbor decides, okay, we also accept that we're not going to have uh, uh, taxes on carbon, we're going to have subsidies to do the same end, that means bias against Canadian goods. And if Canada chooses the path of subsidy, as I, as I think it's now committed to do, it too will be market distorted. Now, I don't say this in a sense of um, that I think there's a clear other, I think there are too many commitments to take the path of subsidy rather than taxes. But, but people need to be clear eyed that these subsidies are going to have a lot of irrational negative effects, trade protection and economy distorting. That's what you're signing up for. Um, I think if you know the price, you should know the price. But the promise that there is a free way to get from point mm -hmm. A to B, that's always a deception. Yeah, well said. Um, now, I, I should say um, some listeners and, and, and viewers may be hearing this, and I think what, what they would in, invariably say is that other major producers like Russia or Iraq aren't presumably as motivated by environmental concerns and that the risk, of course, is, and one certainly hears this in Canada, that oil producing countries like Canada and the US impose stringent climate policies around their sectors and others don't, and the production just flows to these other places such that global emissions are unchanged or perhaps even even higher. Yeah. How, how, how would you respond to that? How do we manage that balancing act? I keep vowing not to be a broken record and that I'm a broken record. It is true. <laughs> if the way, if your way to combat greenhouse gas emissions is to is regulation and subsidy, then you do put domestic industry at a disadvantage. If, however, I mean, you can put taxes on the border. Um, and that's, that is the most powerful thing about a about a carbon tax, it is, is that it is also a carbon tariff, if need be. And so, yeah, Russia can pr pump away, and maybe India will buy Russian gas, which because it's cheap, or Russian oil, because it's cheaper. And then, but what does India do with it? Ultimately, it has to sell goods and services to the rest of the world. And if it turns out, oh, oh, if you use an Indian call center, because they have cheaper electricity, because they're burning uh, coal, or they have other cheaper costs, guess what? That is adjusted uh, that that advantage, that competitive advantage, can be taken away. Um, it, if you are using the subsidy approach or the regulatory approach, then you're chasing a, a, an infinitely moving target. Um, that's the that's the path we're on. So that's the path we're going to be. We're going to have to find some way to chase an infinitely moving target. Um, but remember, all these the, the point of energy is not to consume it at, for its own sake. It's to consume it to make goods and services. And the goods and services um, move across borders in one way or another. Um, and the services are a little hard. Obviously, the economics of that is harder. How do you attribute the electricity cost to a call center? But it's not beyond the wit of human beings aided by powerful computers to figure out an answer to those questions. I, I was on a call this morning, David, with uh, some academics, former senior public servants, and even some former politicians talking about among other items, uh, Canada's place in the world in general, and in particular, its relationship with the United States. And, and someone said that what Canada ought to be doing is making itself useful to the United States, that that's the way to strengthen uh, the bilateral relationship and, and Canada's uh, place in terms of in, in terms of the co policy conversation in, in Washington. If, if policymakers were listening to this conversation, how, David, can they get Washington and to, in effect, sign on to the continental energy environmental agenda that you were talking about here? Um, look, the answer, it, it, in a way, it's too big a question for too small a uh, piece of paper here, because the question is not just with energy. The question, how does Canada make itself felt? And the answer is um, have a well-functioning economy, have well-ordered finances, um, uh, contribute your share to maintaining the peace of the world, um, and you will and, and have um, capable security and other uh, state institutions. And then you'll discover that the world beats a path to your door. Um, and 
the the use the problems will keep changing their form the nature of the use will always be changing but the a strong economy well-ordered finances capable security services uh, the ability to contribute your share maybe a little more than your share uh, to come to the common upkeep that's how a country of, of middle rank uh, gets more than middle notice um, the Canadian problem has always been that Canada has sought to underpay and over, and and receive over credit. The Canadians say, is there some answer to this question other than contributing your fair share? Maybe it could be by striking more moralistic attitudes than other people. Maybe that, that could be our contribution. So you know what? Striking more moralistic attitudes than other people is not seen by other people as a useful contribution. <laughs> uh, uh, final question. Um, a couple of weeks ago, we spoke about your forthcoming essay uh, in the Atlantic, a book, Woodrow Wilson, it's now out. And as I said, then I'd encourage listeners and viewers to check it out. Uh, tell us, David, a bit about uh, the reaction to the essay. What what have you heard and, and, and how have people responded? Yeah, well, the key factor with the essay is it's quite long. Uh, and so uh, even before Twitter, not everybody reads it, and especially in the age of Twitter. So some of the reactions just been people repeating the very things that are criticized by the article as if they had never been criticized. Um, um, and so you hear again, people say, well, Wilson was a unique racist, which he he was certainly a racist, but he was not so uniquely so, or um, saying he's bad for the usual, uh, because people are mad about the Federal Reserve. Um, but the re what I would ask people to think about as they read the others, especially Canadians, um, the United States in 100 years ago was a wealthy and powerful country then as now. Uh, the leaders of the United States in the first part of the 20th century, President McKinley, President Teddy Roosevelt, were very ambitious for the United States. Um, McKinley led the United States into the Spanish-American War, which um, took Puerto Rico and the Philippines and brought independence to Cuba. Teddy Roosevelt, Panama Canal, the big uh, building of an American Navy. But all of, both of them thought of American power as something that was wielded by America for America without reference to anybody else. They were very much like the kind of nationalists you saw at the same time in other European countries. Wilson, who was a little slower off the mark and who was influenced a lot by moralism and, and other bad impulses, but he, figured, he was the first to really perceive and act on the inside that security is shared. In the modern and his his speeches on entry into the First World War, when he said um, we want to make the world safe for democracy, that is not the same as making the world democratic, uh, but safe for democracy. And when he said democracy, he didn't just mean American democracy alone; he meant other democracies too. That he began to evolve a concept that would flourish later of um, achieving security not by competing with other countries, but by cooperating with other countries. And oh my, is that an idea? we need to defend now because um, that, that, as you and I speak, on the floor, it has just passed the United States Senate, on the way to the House is a bill where America will support endangered allies, um, Taiwan and Ukraine and Israel. And it's it's hotly contested in ways that would have been very familiar in the debates of 1940 and 41 and the debates of 1916, 1917. It's always uh, an intensely difficult question in the United States to persuade Americans that um, their power and wealth can benefit themselves best by also helping others too. And Wilson gave, was the first to give at the highest level of the state, the most eloquent voice to that idea. It's an idea we need. And we also need to understand the connection between trade and peace. Um, there has been a tendency on the American right to try to upvalorize the post Wilson presidents, Harding, Coolidge. Uh, Coolidge did a big tax cut. Um, and so people want to admire tax cuts that have, have revered Coolidge and, and made him out to be a more, I mean, Coolidge was a man of great personal integrity uh, and honesty. There's a lot to admire, but he was not a, a major figure. And Harding was very affable and good natured, but he was even less a major figure. Hoover, Herbert Hoover was a major figure. But what all of these three presidents post Wilson shared was they committed the United States to return to the path of high tariffs. Um, and that meant that war ravaged Europe could not export to the United States. And um, without wasting a lot of time here on it, that when in 1921 and 23, the United States locked German and British and Belgian and Italian and French goods out of the US market, it put those countries on a path away from peaceful redevelopment, the path they took in the 1940s and 50s, and put them on a path to accumulating more debt, uh, domestic deflation, um, and decisions that led to the crises of the 20s and then ultimately the Great Depression and the rise of fascism. So don't do that mistake again. Learn from the past. 
Um, there, the history never repeats itself exactly. Uh, the lessons are always approximate. But if there is if there is one lesson, it is uh, that you really should take. It is that trade protection means conflict, and conflict can mean war. Uh, free trade uh, brings mutual benefit and brings peace. Uh, that's a great way to wrap up a conversation. And it relates, of course, to what we've been talking about today, um, and energy and, and climate change. Uh, David, I want to thank you for joining us. And I look forward to catch up in a couple of weeks. Bye-bye.